This video is going to be addressing some of the embryological evidence for evolution. During development, organisms encounter several forks that they can either go one of two paths on. Now, by examination of those paths, which ones are chosen, and the pattern that emerges, we can place an organism in its proper location in the phylogenetic tree. Note that this is similar to how a field guide works if you have ever used one, in where you take a look at, you know, you open it up and you have an unidentified plant, and you say, well, does it have two leaves or three leaves? Where are the, the buds at? Where are the nodes at? And by going down this path of characteristics and the certain pattern, you can eventually arrive at the species that you want. This is what we're going to be doing only with an organism's developmental paths. Please note that some of this information is somewhat technical, however it's important because it'll be used heavily in an upcoming video. Please note that these forks occur all throughout animal life, however I'm specifically going to be focusing on the forks that start at the beginning of um, animals all the way up to vertebrates. So again, this is these are all invertebrates. So the very first division that one can make when examining the tree of life is whether or not an organism has true tissues or not. Now, as far as animals are concerned, if an organism does not have true tissues, it belongs in the phylum periphera, or that is sponges. Every other organism in the animal kingdom, except for periphera, have true tissues. So we move those over to the right. The next giant fork in the evolutionary tree of life can be seen in assessing the number of germ layers that an organism has. Now a germ layer is essentially a type of tissue that is seen during embryological development. More primitive organisms tend to have only two different types of germ layers, endoderm and ectoderm, and these organisms are called diploblastic. Organisms that are diploblastic are, for example, the cnidarians, which are the sea anemones, your corals, um, jellyfish, things like that and stenophores, which are your comb jellies. Now, the opposite of this, of being diploblastic, would be being triploblastic, and that's having three germ layers during development. Endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. And while this seems like a, like a small comparison or a little thing to be nitpicking about, every organism in the tree of life can be placed into one of two categories without exception, and it absolutely never fails. So while jellyfish and things of that nature are diploblastic, all other invertebrates, and in fact all other animals, are triploblastic. So if an organism is triploblastic, we can then go on to check and see whether or not it has a coelom, which is a body cavity. Now, organisms which do not have body cavities or true body cavities are called acelomates, and those are tapeworms and roundworms. Now there are other organisms which are pseudocelomates, and those as the name implies, don't have a true, properly um, designed body cavity lined by mesoderm. Examples of these are rotifers and roundworms. Now all the remaining organisms in the tree of life do have a true coelom that's properly lined by mesoderm. So as an organism is developing, it first starts out as a, as a ball of cells, and then one side of that ball basically gets indented. Think about taking a tennis ball and pressing your finger on the side or into the side of it. Now that indentation is basically called a blastopore. Now that blastopore can become one of two things. It can either become the mouth or become the anus. Now if the blastopore becomes the mouth, that organism is called a protostome. And examples of it are arthropods, mollusks, annelids, which are basically you know like insects, octopi, snails, earthworms, etc. Now, if the blastopore becomes the anus, it develops as first, and it's called a deuterostome. And examples of this are echinodermata and chordata, which are us, and starfish, and things of that nature. So, why do I mention all of this? What's the big picture, I guess, in me going through all of these technical schisms throughout the invertebrate tree of life? Well, there are several conclusions that can be drawn from taking note of these characteristics in organisms. First is that we can get a basic phylogenetic tree. That is to say, take a look at this image that's been displayed basically the entire time. What you see are the, the evolution of animals. Um, first you have the, the first division, true tissues, no, the, their periphery and sponges, and then we go on to yes, which are basically all of the other organisms. Taking a look at germ layers, we've got cnidarians and stenophores, or tenophores, which are up diploblastic at the top, everything else is triploblastic. Then we've got acelomates, pseudocelomates, and everything else has a true coelom. Blastophore, blastopore forms the mouth, protostomic, and that encompasses all the annelids, mollusks, arthropods, things of that nature, and then everything else is a deuterostome. Well, this is a perfect tree of life, based just upon these observations. And there are several other observations that one can make, and it basically deals with 
whether or not the cells are pre-programmed or not to become certain things, and also the way that cells stack upon each other, symmetry, things of that nature. But this is a fairly simplistic way of looking at organisms, how they develop, and forming a tree of life based just upon these features. This is ignoring absolutely everything else. So again, looking at just these few characteristics, we can get a fairly complete phylogenetic tree of the entire invertebrate um, clade, taking a look at all of the invertebrate phyla. Another important thing about this is that there are no variations of, of animals in a more primitive class displaying more advanced characteristics. For example, you will never find a diploblastic um, deuterostome. You simply don't find it. And this is invariable. This is the same example of why you never find a dragonfly with a cell wall. This would be a fantastically easy way for somebody to go and disprove evolution, but you simply never find it because it doesn't exist. The organisms which were set um, into a, the diploblastic classification never developed the genes or the capability of becoming a deuterostome, so you will never find one that is. This is invariable. If organisms were just kind of scattered about, why would we expect them to be all adhering to this set pattern? Now, it's not that they were just all created by the, the same creator, therefore he used the same plan, because, hey, deuterostomes and protostomes were all created by the same creator, allegedly. So we would expect it to be evenly distributed. But no, we don't find that even distribution. We find a very set, invariable pattern that is only explainable by common descent. Well, thanks a lot for your attention as always, guys. Please note that this video and the information contained in it is going to be used as a premise for an upcoming video. So I know that the information is, is somewhat technical, but it is important to know, and it will help later when I try and illustrate an even broader point. So thanks again, and here it is, your moment of zen. And Fox News attacks the New York Times by literally altering pictures of a Times editor and reporter to make them look uglier than they are. Yes, they really did it and did not say that they were doing it. Beat the Press is next. It's time for tonight's Beat the Press, our daily look back at media hypocrisy, agendas, and the amusing perils of live TV. First up over at Fox News, they really outdid themselves this morning. They were upset at a New York Times article titled, Fox News Finds Its Rivals Closing In, which we are. So rather than address the substance, they targeted New York Times editor Stephen Redicliffe and reporter Jacques Steinberg. But look carefully at the pictures they use. His boss, the guy who assigned him to this, is a fellow by the name of Stephen Redcliffe. And Mr. Redcliffe actually used to work for this company. He sends his attack dog, Jacques Steinberg, out, that fellow right there, the writer for the New York uh, Times, to do these hit pieces. Hit piece? How about the fact that they altered the photos? Compare the actual picture of editor Stephen Redcliffe to the one they used. They yellowed his teeth, blackened his eyes, receded his hairline, and here's reporter Jacques Steinberg and what Fox used. They gave him a bigger nose and again, blackened his eyes and yellowed his teeth. They report, you decide.